and we're live with another episode of adventures in devops warren what's going on i wish i had something good to say uh you know, you put me <laughs> on the spot there I, I guess i can lead with my my facts right um, my fault for asking you how you're doing my yeah, bad i, I should have known better <laughs> yeah i know it's uh it's been quite a number of episodes already i i feel like you know you really got to square that away before the, the episode starts. <laughs> I will. I will say I. I was a little bit dis, uh, disappointed by this, but I found out recently that there are companies that leak their data on purpose. Uh, they use it as an advertisement strategy, so people learn about the company, uh, so VCs can learn about them and potentially buy them later because it's such a great turnaround to say, "Hey, we had security problems in the past, but then we fixed them." So if you see on your LinkedIn stream or social media accounts some company saying, "Oh no, uh, this hotel chain or." A healthcare provider leaked all their patient records. It may have been an intentional strategy, just so that you will learn about them and then maybe start paying them money in the future. I can only say that I'm disappointed, but not surprised. But uh, also joining us today, I'm super excited about this episode because I've been following today's guest for for quite a while through on uh, 90 days of co of DevOps and through all of your posts on X. So Michael Cade, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, our pleasure. And I'm, I'm excited. So for those who maybe have never logged on to Twitter, because I think that's the requirement to start seeing your posts is just actually log on. So, so for someone who's never been on there, give us like the short version of your background. So... Yeah, I'm, so I'm a, the posh title is a field CTO at Veeam Software. If you know Veeam Software, we focus on protecting workloads here, there, and everywhere. And what I mean by that is we started off with virtualization backup and then got into cloud-based and SaaS-based and even Kubernetes-based backups. So running stateful workloads, running databases, you name it, we'll protect it type thing. And the important part is, is backup is the boring part. The recovery is the, the easy part. But... I guess more to the point where where you came in, Will, was around a project that I started kind of as we came out of the pan, or even the last year of the, the pandemic, um, was 90 Days of DevOps. And if you go to 90daysofdevops.com, it was really about um, learning in public, like being vulnerable and putting some structured learning a, a, out there. It never was intended to be as big as this to help as many people. It was there to help me. It's just, it started out as my notes, right? Which my Twitter is a graveyard of notes, really, that I'm just shouting in my own little bubble. Um, but yeah, I've been in the infrastructure world for 20 years. I would say the last three to five years has been focused around DevOps and then more recently around cloud and cloud native. So yeah, definitely listening to the podcast and, and taking a lot in, so... Yeah. Right on. So 90 days of DevOps was your like learning in public thing, but that's been more than 90 days ago. So what's the current state of that? Yeah. So we started in 2022, I think it was. And that was me going through the, the weird roads of DevOps, if you will. And I didn't want, like, I'd seen loads of people do 100 days of code or 100 days of Kubernetes and 100 days of this and 100 days of cloud. And I was like, I can't, I can't concentrate for 100 days. I can't do that. And DevOps isn't, you can't do it. Like, DevOps isn't just one area, right? As you, as you all know. Um, so I took that concept of 90 days of DevOps. And this was, this was on New Year's Eve as we were going into 2022. We were just in a pandemic and, as most of my my friends would be out drinking, I'm sat at home going, right, how do we kick kickstart this year? And normally it's a fitness challenge for 90 days or or something like that. This year was no, what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna start a Git repository and we're gonna start loads of markdown files and we're gonna go through twelve or thirteen different topics of DevOps and we're going to not deep dive into them, but we're gonna get a little bit we're gonna get we're gonna get the big picture. We're going to get some theory around that, and we're going to get some hands-on over all of these weird and wonderful words that we see in the in the industry. So there's a topic around Golang, but Golang not as a developer. I'm not a developer by any stretch, but 
what does a programming language look like from a DevOps point of view? We need to know, maybe we need to know how to read the code, just to understand mm -hmm. it. Maybe we do need to understand how to create a little, little, um, a little bit better than a bash script on how to achieve like some automation. There's Kubernetes in there, containerization, Linux, networking, all of that, and how it pertains to to the DevOps topic. And it, so that was the first year. It was 110,000 words. It was basically a blog a day for 90 days. We fast forward to 2023. And instead of me doing that, and I missed out so much around security. And I think the world missed out on, if you think about 2022, DevOps was the, was the thing. DevSecOps was the, the new thing as we went through 2023 or 2022 into 2023. So I went out, spoke to some friends and they, they, as SMEs, they subject matter experts, they came out and they, they provided the blog posts for each day of their section for the 2023 edition. And then just recently, like of March the 31st, we finished 90 days again, but I wanted to, we couldn't just do like, let's write a load more things. I, I wanted to change up what that was. So we put out a call for papers and we actually had 91 sessions from 91 different people. It was 91 for a reason. It was a leap year this year. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we had all of those, all of those sessions on YouTube as well. So it was about changing the, um, like the, the format of what it was. Right on. So we're just taking the different topics and then dedicating a day to each of those topics so that you can do, uh, you know, a little bit deeper than just hello world on those and kind of walk away with a, um, not like a expert level knowledge, but like a conversational knowledge of that topic. Yeah, exactly that. Like it was probably seven days up for each of the topics. So we kicked off okay. the first, the first nine, 90 days in 2022 was what is DevOps? Like I, I've seen your videos, Will, that, that kind of touches on, on this. And it was about like, so what is DevOps and why DevOps and where did it even come from? And how, why are we, why are we talking about it in 2022 when it's been around since 2009, like that sort of thing. And some of the use cases, and it's always the use cases that we hear about, oh, it's Netflix did this, AWS did that. It's ne like, and so I wanted to actually, well, what about the company down the road? How are they using DevOps? So we went into a little bit more of a DevOps for the, the, normal, the normal company, not the fan company. And then we kick off for seven days of like, so the first topic is Golang, learning a programming language. And there was a mixed... Uh, I got mixed feedback on that because really, and I'd be interested in what, what your programming language of choice would be to learn first from a DevOps point of view. I expect I know what the answer would be, but I'd be interested in, in your takes. Yeah, for me, uh, my answer is, is very nuanced. Like my first answer is what's the team you're working with using you know, because if, if like you're working with a full full stack JavaScript shop, just go with that so that you have some more connective tissue with the rest of your team. I think that's going to serve you much, much more long term in helping that team than um, learning Go and being like the outsider who's always trying to sell this um you know, so I, I, I approach it from a conversational point of view. Where am I going to have the most conversation touch points with the people that I'm supporting? And so whatever their primary stack is would be my first choice. Uh, assuming that, you know, they're not using Java. I wouldn't recommend Java, <laughs> the first language. <laughs> but if you if the field's wide open, you know, I would um, I think I would just stick with I would I would recommend Go. It's just okay. it, to me, it feels it feels very um manageable to pick up as a first language uh, yeah I mean, to add, yeah yeah for sure i mean i think will will's nailed the most important part here which is really the context i mean if we think about what devops is it's really about uh merging of the mindsets and uh, applying it no matter where you are so meeting the team where they're at 
And I don't think I've sort of, I often will advise companies and their engineering departments are using all sorts of strange things that I would never personally use. We'll mention Java, but I've seen Ruby and everything else. And there are some languages that I prefer to use personally more than, more than others. And I see sort of uh, concrete problems that show up because of the language of choice. And you can maybe overcome those by picking something different, right? The sorts of problems you'll end up with a non-strong type language versus uh, ones such as Go or Rust or whatever, you know, there are concrete benefits of using those. But when you think about here's where the team is at, what is the problem that we need to solve? Trying to pull in the tools to help you do it and not necessarily going out and changing the language. Although, you know, I, I've seen often there is this problem where a team may not be able to embody the mindset that comes with DevOps because potentially of the language or frameworks that they're using, they're just not conducive to thinking about those things. They're still a very much built in, you use this language, language thinks about throwing stuff over the wall to another team to go and run it. Uh, you're going to run into a problem there. And sometimes you got to change the tools to, to match what you want. But, you know, if we're looking on the other side, you know, what would I pick personally? I've been super successful with JavaScript, TypeScript, and, and Rust, but I don't think the domain is super critical there. No, and you both you both hit on it, right? And the reason I chose Go because Veeam Kasten, an acquisition that we'd made in 2020, they were using Golang to write their cloud native product. I didn't know Go. I didn't, in fact, I didn't know any programming language. So that seemed like a good start. But the amount of people that were like, "You should. this should be Python, this should be Python, or this should be something else. And I get that. But to, to both of your point, but I chose it for that reason. And I documented, and bearing in mind, we're on day, I think we start this on day seven, the first time I've ever done this. And this is me writing notes, like me and my mum know about this. That's it. So <laughs> it's, it's, it, it didn't turn out to be the 25,000 plus stars that are on GitHub for it now. Like I can understand that then, like, but, but, and we covered Python in the second year as well, but, um, and, and there's obviously so many more, but it's about, it was for me, it was so I could actually, and it wasn't for me to become a Go developer, because I don't, I think the point is, is a programming language for DevOps is very different to being an app developer in that I just want to be able to read this language. I want to be able to potentially make a CLI or some sort of tool that helps with my day-to-day -day job. And the fact is, is that Go is like a, a great language for that. So are, so are others. But I chose it for them, them reason. I did point that out in there as well. But basically, just to, to go back to, to why, like how, how these modules, if you will, are, are like set up, is that the first day we talk about programming languages in DevOps. So I went away and I researched that for Generally, I would have spent about an hour, two hours watching YouTube videos. A lot of yours will as well, and 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 others, the smart people, and they're all referenced at the bottom of that. But the days as well, right? I, like I'm not again. This isn't. This wasn't anything for me. This is about providing structured learning that we didn't have, and I, I still don't right. think like, I'm not. I, I'm not the answer to this. Is that? Oh, learn DevOps. But Will's DevOps journey and yours, Warren, and mine are all different. And if we work at three different companies, uh, your DevOps responsibilities are very different as well. Like we might touch the same similar things, but everything is everything is a little bit different. And it's more of a mindset on oh, how can I learn quickly to understand the benefit of this? And if it's not right, throw it in the bin. Let's go again. Like that's the that's the premise. But I didn't. I couldn't find that one YouTuber that was like, well, fixing my addiction to YouTube following the pandemic um, that so many people had. Um, so I thought, well, I'm going to create something that I, at least will help me because I forget everything. So I want to be able to go back and reference this. So we go through the big picture. We go through a bit of theory about what Go is, how it works, how it compiles, blah, blah, blah. Then we get hands on and we start interacting with the Twitter API um, that's now been changed. So that I need to update that. But it was basically a, a little Twitter bot that would that you could write a bit bit more of that, like two hundred one of of the of of the hello world, 
how can I interact with an API to make it do something as and when something happens? Um, so that long-winded, that was what we started with. But each one of those sections, those modules, takes that big picture, bit of theory, and then some hands-on to that. I mean, I think really shouldn't undersell this here. I mean, you've got a repository on GitHub that has over 26,000 stars. And Which it is really wild. is. Which I know for sure. And in such a short period of time, it seems. And it's really just you going and learning these individual topics one after another one um, to a sufficient degree that other people can go in and see it and uh, get that same sort of learning. And really, it's not about the maybe physical tool, but the real mindset that's behind DevOps and have a whole new approach that they can take to uh, even their own projects or back to their, their workplace and share it with others. Yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been wild, a wild three years, that's for sure. And bringing on all of the community members to do the talks. Like if you look at some of those sessions, some of those are like gold. They're the sessions that you'd go to if you went, if you went to conferences they're the ones that you'd actively like. Oh, what, I need to see this. And perspective is so important in our in our DevOps world. Is that again, just because I do something my way and that's my responsibility, it won't be the same as what Will does or you, Warren. So seeing these all these different sessions on AWS, Azure, Terraform, Pulumi, like all of the I guess competing products. But with a bit of an overlap as well, like it's pick your, it's about picking your picking picking your horse, right? And but no, you can swap horses halfway through, like the amount <laughs> I've done with Palumi and HashiCorp as well. So yeah, I just uh, like I'm I'm in a position as well at Veeam where they give me the opportunity to do this, which is incredible. You think three years ago, pre-pandemic, I was purely focused on storage and virtualization. I'd done a bit of Terraform, I'd done a bit of Ansible, I'd done a bit of Cloud, but that was it. Throw me into this gave me the opportunity to then go and learn a whole new community, a whole new ecosystem, whilst still getting paid for it. Like I started a new job without having to start a new job. So it is, it's incredible, like all of the community, there's a Discord channel as well with over a thousand people in there. Uh, it, it, it's brilliant. And like always already being asked what what are we doing next year <laughs> oh well we have to take a year to th figure that one out <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you touched on something i think really important and that's especially in the devops uh mindset uh, sort of corner of the world that we end up finding ourselves in we n don't usually have experienced mentors that are within the same company or same organizational area as, as us. And it can be quite the challenge of actually figuring out how to level up effectively within that scope. And, uh, you know, my usual recommendation is, you know, where are you getting information from the outside world that, that's happening outside your company? And there's usually silence there. Like, obviously, there's some amount of challenge to engage yourself with content or other companies uh, because not everything is public. So going out and actually finding good streams of information is for sure actually a challenge, but it's something that everyone who has a DevOps, you know, is embodying the DevOps mindset really needs to do in some regard. Interesting you say that as well. Like, so the dev stats that you can get on the repo, uh, I'll let I'll let the audience go and look up the big, big companies that are behind it and that they've not contacted or anything. But there's some pretty big, 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 big vendors out there that are using this for what I can only see as a, a bit of an onboarding, uh, like an onboarding kind of course for their for their people. Interesting. To be fair, I don't do any sponsorship or anything like that on there. So there's no real way for them to reach out for that. I, I could imagine companies reaching out to you, though, and asking you to come and actually speak or, you know, pick some of your favorite modules uh, that are fit for the company and getting to actually talk through or workshop them. So if it all goes wrong at Veeam, maybe that's the, <laughs> maybe that's the way to go. But so and I made it I made it quite clear earlier on that none of this is sponsored content. So if I chose Argo CD is because I wanted to. There was no, uh, there was no influence at all, um, and 
I had another, uh, how can I put this without naming names, but everyone will know if I say it. Um, a typical database company that have a very strong licensing opinion. Um, they reached out about their cloud infrastructure and, uh, and they wanted me to cover them and they'd pay. And that's what, and I said, but that's going to lose the spirit of the, of the whole, whole process. Like I could do, and I, I, I can say this cause I'm a HashiCorp ambassador and it wasn't then, but like I've suggested I could do seven days of HashiCorp. We could go through seven products. We could do 10 days of HashiCorp, I think probably, um, and that'd be a great idea, but it'd have to be organic content. It wouldn't be, you tell me what to write, you pay me to do that because you lose the, the trust with the community a lot of the time with that, that element of, of why we do this stuff. Um, and really the, the whole, again, it goes back to the reason why I did this. Why did I start this? Because obviously when you start a project, you start with a logo and you start with a domain. That's before you even get into any of the hard work. Right. Um, it, it was it was all about it was all about learning. It was all about me just learning in public. I've been around several different communities, virtualization, VMware, um, NetApp from a storage perspective. HashiCorp was then there on the edge before I jumped into the the more of the cloud and cloud native world. And there's never been like I what I. I had a conversation about this the other the other week about it's all about putting down the ladder use the ladder to get up you might have used some videos some content somewhere and you can there's some people in this world that will absolutely take that ladder with them and they're never going to drop it down but if you can drop that down and help one person then it's going to be massively Im impactful for that person wherever they are in the world right um and i've i've had that same ethos from talk, doing blogs about OpenStack 15 years ago, um, is that even if you document something, blog something, and it only helps one person, then it's worth doing. Again, same for this, right? That's why I did it on an open Git, GitHub repo, was if it helps one person, then it's worth, worth doing. And it helped me as well. So that was why. Yeah, and I think it's admirable just to avoid the sponsorship route because you know like you're putting in a ton of time and effort on this like not only just to learn your own thing but because you're you're trying to do it in public and you're trying to share it so that it is helpful for someone else so that puts a lot of additional steps in achieving a task you know because you could have done this yourself in a notepad doc on your desktop and gotten all the benefits there, but choosing to share it, you know, adds an extra level of work to it. That's a huge time commitment. And I think that's part of the allure of doing sponsored videos uh, or taking on sponsorships because it, it helps you feel like you're justifying some of that time. But at the same time, I, I agree with you. Whenever you choose to take on the sponsorship in my mind, that changes the scope of work because now instead of creating something for me to share um, I have to create something for the sponsor that represents their brand and those are in some and sometimes two entirely different pieces of content uh, yeah, absolutely and I know I know that there's a day and I'll let I'll let people go and find the day but where I'm trying to get answer uh, not answerable I'm trying to get Jenkins up and running in a Docker container, <laughs> which it, it clearly wasn't built for this situation, right? It was no. <laughs> <laughs> but we're like, even in the comments, I know I there's a paragraph there going, I couldn't get this to work. Then there's an update. I got this to work, but I had to do this, 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 and this. And that, I left it all in because people will have that same problem. They'll have that same issue um and but if that was if that was jenkins paying for said said blog or said youtube video they wouldn't want me to fail they'd want it to be clean crisp cut like this is how it works now i know that's not that's not fair to all vendors or projects out there some will like to see the like warts and all but 
the majority would uh, would one hundred percent want it to be clean cut and look how good our software is. Yeah, yeah think, for sure. I think there's a huge brand component to this. Like when you're going out and you're creating content for the world. Uh, what does that say about the person who is creating that content realistically? And you take that with you when you go somewhere else. If you want to be someone who sells your content, you know, that's your job or that's who you want to be, then, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to be someone who creates publicly available content, you know, that becomes part of your brand. And I feel like at the upper echelon levels of software engineering, there is this expectation that you are positively contributing to the community. And I feel like going out and selling your content isn't necessarily aligned with that. Uh, being able to provide it for free or at conferences or through trainings, workshops, etc. Uh, there's a very different perspective there. And I, I don't think we can get as far with just only sponsored content, as you said, for the obvious reasons of uh, companies paying for I mean, if you're doing that, then you're likely going to end up uh, competing with LLMs in the future uh, who are going to optimize for just getting the work done rather than the actual, you know, learning experience. Oh, yeah, yeah. not an issue. <laughs> no, no LLM can butcher the English language as badly as I can. I've got that market cornered. <laughs> yeah, Yo, you wouldn't believe the amount of contributions on the repo as well for for. A, a native English guy <laughs> making mistakes. <laughs> right. it's a green, it's a green tit, it's a green box, right? You can people have well, the mind blowing thing is not only that, like there is a hell of a lot of um, spelling and grammar mistakes that have been corrected, but equally, it's been translated into different like languages. If you go, if you go to the the uh, um, to the repo and you go to twenty twenty two. At the top there, you'll see it's been translated into Viet Vietnamese, Chinese, Polish. But it's it, it's not ridiculous. It's amazing, but it's ridiculous. <laughs> That's so cool. I just hope they're, so I cool. hope they're not writing anything bad about me. <laughs> <laughs> so, what kind of feedback? I mean, obviously, with twenty six thousand stars, you know, there's been. You've, you've hit a chord in the community. It's definitely appreciated content. Have you gotten like any, um, any success stories or like really cool feedback moments? Cause I, I know just in the YouTube videos I've done, there's been a few people who have reached out, reached out to me over the years and said, Hey, I watched your videos and, um, did the things that you suggested in this particular video. And it helped me land my first job, you know? And, and to me, like that was just mind blowing. Like, I don't know what the rest of my life holds, but to hear something like that, like you had that kind of impact on someone's life, like that's crowning achievement to me. So what, what have you gotten back for feedback from this? So, so similar will, um, similar things like people that are just starting out of college and they'll use the repo and, Oh, I landed my first job. And also, I think personal, like, so personally, that's brilliant. Like the same as you will, like for, to think that I would ever have an impact on anyone's life is incredible. Like I never thought, so probably the same as you, is that I never thought that that would be a, a thing. I didn't think I'd build something that would impact someone. Um, but equally on a, on, a, on a personal level as well, it's enabled me to go and speak at events. Like I've always done public speaking from a, Again, virtualization storage like VMworld before it was VMware Explore, all of that. I've done the yearly conference trips, but I hadn't done the DevOps conference trips. I hadn't been to HashiConf. I hadn't been to other like uh, We Are Developers, for example. And I strongly believe that doing this gave me a little bit more credibility to be able to go and do that. And yeah. and I think to your point, Warren, I think also the amount of people that I've had reach out to me saying, like, if it doesn't, if it doesn't work out of beam, like just like, give us a, give us a ring. Like, because that's, it's a, it's a community angle that they see that they could, they could use within their, within their efforts in the community as well. 
but yeah, I think I think overall is it's about helping helping people. That's the that's the biggest thing. Um, and then yeah, the thought leadership or the 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 ability to be um, validated to go and speak at these events is is nice and quite frankly strange as well. But people <laughs> people speak about. It. I think the one the one that really um, hits home for me is the hashi. HashiComp, when it was in Amsterdam two years ago, I was speaking there and it was a, they asked me to speak about 90 Days of DevOps. It was like a 15, 20 minute type community session. And it was equally quite strange to talk about it then. And bearing in mind that's two years ago, we'd only just finished that first one. We were probably on 10,000 stars. but And then having people come up to you and say, this is amazing. Can't believe I haven't seen it. And to your initial point, Will, like you only hear about it on on Twitter or on X. But I need to be better at sharing this stuff as well elsewhere. That's the hard part, you know. Um, I think because that requires an a completely different set of skills to promote your work, and and you have to learn those. And it feels very awkward to learn those, you know. Um, especially whenever you take this from the approach of like, I'm just doing this to, to maintain my own skill set in my chosen career path, you know, and then you have, you turn that around. You're like, Oh, how do I promote myself and market my content that was never really meant to be content anyway. And I remember like the, one of the key moments for me was the first time I had to write a bio for a talk I was giving, you know, and you're, you write, you write your own bio in the third person. And, you know, to me, that was just like blue screen of death in the brain, you know, just couldn't wrap my head around that. Yeah. Yeah. I get exactly the same. Anything about myself is like, to your point, Warren, like whatever this is, it doesn't, it just feels strange of, of like how, how big it's become or even like, and I'm a, I'm a, ultimately i'm a pessimist at heart anyway in that you look at those those twenty five thousand stars and i just sit like are they important are they just vanity metrics if that was software you'd be up there with one of the biggest like and I, i'm like that's that's crazy so so yeah it's 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 a it's an interesting and and i've seen others as well do like follow that into like creating content sharing in public and all of that good stuff. And, and yeah, it's been a, um, yeah, it's been good. It, like people cloning the repository and then going off and doing their own journey, which was kind of the idea as well in that if I could, if you could build a template repo for people to go and walk and talk the same thing, you go and learn and then you get a perspective. And then we start sharing lots, lots of different perspectives. That's, we are all going to learn a lot more. And Warren, actually, you brought up a good point, and someone else said about this. Like, are you worried about LLMs having all of this information? I'm like, well, I I didn't make it up. This information <laughs> is fully available. If you go to the bottom of each day, there's smarter people than me talking about this stuff all over the internet, and there's heaps of documentation that touches on all of this. If an LLM can take 90 days of DevOps and make things easier, let's go. Like, that's only a good thing as well. So, yeah, for sure. So uh, one thing I want to talk about with you, because you've got, you know, your, your role at Veeam and then you're creating this on the side. And then I know that you're also active physically. So how do you structure your day or what's your thought process for balancing those different areas of your life? No, that's a good one. I don't know if I balance anything, but we'll... <laughs> and and for anyone that follows me on on any any social media, you'll know that I spend more time on a plane than I do in my own bed, um, or at least in a different country. Um, and the one thing I absolutely love about working for Veeam, and I'm sure other companies are like it, like my opportunity is, or my my goal, or my responsibility at Veeam is to raise awareness and drive some sort of adoption to our software. Now, we have community edition and open source projects. 
that's that to me is still driving adoption. And then we obviously have paid for um, products as well. And raising awareness is what I can do best by talking at events, talking about what we do, some cool use cases that we see out there in the field. And that means jumping on a plane generally and and being and giving those those sessions at things like Red Hat Summit, KubeCon, um, HashiConf and, and others. Um, but the other great thing about Veeam is that, well, every day's every day's different. And you could wake up at eight o'clock on Monday morning and you think this is what we're going into. And then by nine o'clock, it's completely different. And your day changes. <laughs> like every day can be different at Veeam. And that's the exciting bit. And because over the last 10 years, I've been at Veeam for nine and a half years now. So I started and we only had virtual machine backup, VMware backups. And now we have, like, we can back up everything. So I can I can flip and change, and there's all the different communities for each of those different different services. And diving into that, learning something new, being able to like just that that variety is the the win for me to keep that. Now, the one thing I've started this year, or ju- actually just before Christmas, because I've stopped playing rugby, is um is at least moving five k a day. So walking 5k a day or running 5k a day has been like, I have to do that to, because sometimes you can have, like, I've just spun off 10 of those different things that we've got. That that becomes overwhelming when you, and I don't know what number it is, whether it's 12 or 15 things on my plate, but one of those numbers sends me over the edge and I'm sure you're the same, right? So being able to go for a walk somewhere and just out of the, out and about somewhere else or run it just gives you that level set that reset but equally i don't i don't work nine to five i don't think many of us do anymore i think it's a nice like when it's light we work and when it's dark we sleep but i don't (laughs) think that i don't think that matters anymore i think we just get stuff done um i thought for sure you're gonna say when it's dark you also work because (laughs) (laughs) depends on the week right (laughs) or time zone for sure for sure. I mean, my, my number is two, I feel like. If I got something critical going on, something else trying to vie for my attention, I have to be very careful about pulling that in. I think I'm in a very uh, unique position, though, compared to lots of people where I, I get to push things on other people. Uh, so I have to be careful about that. Uh, but yeah, for sure, like at, things that vie for your attention, it's very difficult to even keep track of them all. I was actually talking to Will about this before we started the, the stream about multitasking is uh, a death knell, really. We, as humans, can't really do it that effectively. Your priority list, you do one at a time until until you're sort of done, but you're never done. There's a, there's the next thing on, on the list. So rigorously yeah. prioritizing and pulling out what those things are important. And I think there's a lot to be said for your subconscious because I'm totally with you. I go on short little walks to clear my mind, my conscious mind, while subconsciously I'm working on some difficult problem that doesn't require me to write it down or look at visuals uh, can be really, really helpful, especially when the nature of the work we're doing, it's not just write some code in some IDE somewhere, but it's think deeply about a problem and how it should look like and what that actually means and how to take the next step. And so while you say that you don't have anything like super original there that you, you know, you pull the content from somewhere, I think what is important is how you think about the problem, which I do think may be unique to, uh, you know, everyone involved. And I think that's important and worth remembering. So back to doing a 5K every day. <laughs> I'm going to dig on this. Do you listen to music when you do that or podcasts or go, if, uh, yeah, if go I'm running, naked? If I'm running, I'll, I'll listen to music. If I'm... Uh... If I'm walking, it depends depends on where I'm walking. If I'm walking on a treadmill in the in the in the gym or in the in the living room, I will that's that's YouTube time. But it's it's not it's not DevOps or tech YouTube time. That's although Jeff Jeff Gearlin seems to 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 sneak in there because he he does some some good good home lab stuff that I tend to watch. Um and yeah, maybe a podcast or two, but I spend a lot of time in the car as well, driving to the airport. I'm I'm about ninety minutes away from the from the airport. It's a great oh. time to listen to 
some really good podcasts, right? How um, you've been with with Veeam for nine years, which I feel like is pretty unusual in our industry to to be with the same company that long. What's the reason behind that? So I feel like I've had three, maybe four different jobs since I've been at Veeam. So I started as an SE, so systems engineer. I would go out and keep our salespeople honest um, and <laughs> show, show prospects what, what we do. How do we protect this? What do we do? How do we do it? Um, I was only doing it for 18 months, but in that 18 months, I was still creating content and I was still almost telling stories, right? I, the whole point, I would say if you had to define what my job is, it's about telling stories. It's about telling Veeam stories that I hear out in the field where much smarter people than me suffer so that they have a story to tell. And then they tell me the story and I simplify that, put it into a demo, some sort of story. After 18 months, I moved into what we call now the product strategy group or the office of the CTO. And this was full blown, go anywhere, make noise, raise awareness, speak to engineering, build the product the way it needs to be for the field, go and speak to customers, blah, blah, blah. Right, be part of the community. We have we have a great community around Veeam. Veeam just works. You've heard that tagline, hopefully. Um, and yeah, we have some absolute fanboys who 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 love love Veeam technologies, which is brilliant. So be present there, listen to them. What their feedback is great as well, and then feed that back into engineering or product management. Um, then. So yeah, that's that's the two jobs. Then in the same group, I was um, I was we made an acquisition of a company called Caston. Caston is focused on Kubernetes backup, so PVCs running applications, data databases inside of Kubernetes or even outside. If you're using RDS alongside your application, we're protecting that. We made that purchase in October 2020. The parachute got put on my back to go go and make noise, go and go and be in that community about everything, all things Kubernetes. Like, whoa, like I've not even got I've I don't I've never done containerization yet. So I mean this is the and this is the real start of the journey. You'll see where the DevOps thing comes in um as well as we go through it. But yeah, parachute comes in, I go in, I'm still very wet behind the ears. I still am today, I feel. Um and that was my job is be all things focused on cloud native. And I ended up running some uh, co-located events at KubeCon called um, uh, Cloud Native Data Management Day. And we had some really good speakers talking about databases on Kubernetes, databases outside of Kubernetes, just data in general around that. Then <laughs> probably, well, it must be two and a bit years ago, I got handed some more stuff to look after and talk about. And it kind of fit because speaking to all of these Kubernetes admins or or even developers that were using Kubernetes, the um, the trend was they were never u exclusively using just Kubernetes. They were using virtual machines with databases on because the database was too hard to containerize. It was too important for everything else. Because traditionally, we took that expensive Oracle um, database and we threw everything on, we threw everything into that. Um, in the cloud native world, we don't need to do that, but that doesn't stop the plane still having to fly, right? Um, so anyway, so I got given the remit of now go and look after our cloud products, our Veeam backup for AWS, Azure, and Google and come up with stories to tell around that. So I did, and then fast forward is now we're looking at how what is Veeam's cloud strategy, whilst also still trying to raise awareness, drive adoption of everything that we're doing. So that's really, so I think why nine years or how? It's because I've had four different, three to four different jobs within, it, within the company. To be fair, I've only reported into three different people as, as well um and all in the same structure as well um but yeah I, like I, yeah I, it's it's strange as well when i was at 
when I was in my English class at school, and I'm sure you guys are the same in the in the states, you stood up and you read read a like a chapter of the book or a couple of pages of the book out loud to the rest of your class. I was so scared, like I would almost have sick days because of that. And now I get to like speak to you guys or speak in front of audiences at events. It's it's a funny this imposter syndrome is such a funny funny situation. <laughs> No, I can totally get that. As long as your career is changing in some way, migrating from one area to another one, it, and having those different jobs, even over a long tenure, the brand of the company that you're working for is sort of less relevant in a way, uh, because it's, your role is growing with with you. And maybe on that, I, I might ask: in the context of the 90 days of DevOps, is, has there been like some particular area that you? really enjoyed learning more than others that maybe comes out more or is, you know, more fleshed out. Like you, you see people gravitating towards more than some of the other areas or, you know, was particularly interesting for you. So, so for me personally, it was around databases, learning more about databases because I was in the traditional shop where Microsoft SQL, Oracle, and maybe we started to see a bit of Mongo, but they were the three, they were the three de facto databases, maybe some MySQL and Postgres. But now if you look at the cloud native ecosystem and the amount of databases that we have available to us, it's incredible. Like you can really pick and choose the right tool for the right job. And I feel like that that could be the next space for like some huge um big hitter that that really changes what we do with data. And I've always been like a massive fan around like data visualization and being able to use data for for something good. So we're obviously backing up a lot of stuff. I would like I've worked on prototypes where I can take that data from our backup and glean some insight out of that. So that those were the two big areas in in I guess they span 2022 and 2023 two different topics that like I think I probably could do a few more days on on there because I was learning a lot more about like, what is AWS Neptune and, and just things that you, like I personally never spoke to a customer that uses that and needs to protect it. So it's good, it's, it's better that it's not glazed by, oh, this is a customer meeting, you have to talk about this. It's it's actually my interest on on data. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. Like, I think Golang. The, and, and if I had a chance to change, if I could go back and change it, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't have started talking about a programming language up front. Like we started talking about it here because it's the first module. I would have moved that because I feel like that is a barrier to entry. To think that someone, oh, I'm going to learn DevOps today. They come in, they've never learned a programming language. Oh, we've got to go and learn Golang or Python or something. And you're like, maybe, maybe that was just a little, like, maybe I should have moved that down. Maybe, maybe we should have started with the Linux module, which was second, and then the networking. And then we should have got on to a like containerization. And then I feel like there's a better, a better flow that I would have used the programming language do i do i really need to learn a programming language to be in devops well actually yeah no you could probably get away with not like until way down the line you can you write a bash script are we classing that as a programming language probably not but it gets it gets a job done and it it, it might just be enough if you if you can't write a bash script though then probably don't bother learning golang yet <laughs> that, that that's that's kind of yeah so that would be like if I had any regrets, that would be that would be one to move. It's interesting you bring that up. Actually, I feel like it's easier to learn a programming language than it is to try to write a Bash script correctly. And I think there is something to be said about the complexity of understanding what you're deploying or what you're running or what you're evaluating is can be quite complex. And, and I, I get the sense that learning a programming language is something that has well more complex to work with 
has a much smaller impact. Like I can write a small little app on my machine and not have to think about what the data layer is going to be like or what uh, of the thousands of different kinds of databases out there, providers, you know, which one to pick or even which cloud to go to or how to deploy things or, you know, credit cards being involved and, and money to actually pay for those resources where I feel like all of that does come in to when you're working more in a DevOps space. And uh, so I can totally see the, well, if you don't program, here it maybe is an easy way to get into it rather than, you know, immediately start trying to think about what you're doing. Uh, because I think there is this hesitation or even maybe a crutch in the world where it's like, I want to go learn something, uh, infrastructure. What should I do? You know, what should I go? I was like, well, what's your business problem? You know, what are you actually trying to do? And then there's this disconnect of, well, I don't know. I just want to learn how databases fit together. I'm like, well, it's a good start if you have a need, you know, like, hey, I want to build a recommendation engine or a website or something like that. And then I feel like you're sort of stuck if you don't uh, have at least willing to go and take the step forward of building something out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, you just made me think about, so I have a lot of ideas, I'm sure you guys do as well, about little project, little project ideas. And uh, I, know, I know this goes out to a fair few people as well, but I'd be interested in what people think about source code repository backup, completely changing the, the direction. But think about GitHub, think about GitLab. How do we protect that? And is it is it important? Just to, to go on the business outcomes. I had that conversation this morning. I thought, I know two people that will that will have an answer or I have an idea or a, a theory on that. Well, Will, Will wants you to just, you know, your code is backed up directly in production because that's where you edit it, right? Right. With, uh... Right. CICD means Vim on a production server. <laughs> and it's already replicated to multiple machines, right? Because you need to scale up. So you have, you know, all your code automatically replicated uh, to, you know, tens, maybe hundreds, thousands of machines already. No, but that's that's actually a problem I've never thought of. Um, you know, with GitLab for sure, uh, because I, when I think of GitLab, I think of running your own GitLab servers on your own infrastructure. So there is a definite backup need there. Um, for GitHub, though, I'm I'm paying for the service. I'm assuming, and maybe that's my fault, I'm assuming that they're backing it up. I mean, you I mean, realistically, you are paying for that. I then there's a second question of whether or not it's happening. And I think right. we know of recent like just recent incidents. Uh, involving some companies who we thought would have had a better strategy to avoid uh, a you know, full incident related to individual customers losing all of their data. So, I mean, realistically, I, it's something that you could be concerned with. I think understanding the business continuity strategy that your company has or needs to have and what the risk is and what the impact is of that. For instance, if you have lots of engineers who are working across multiple repositories, you have well-defined teams with a well-defined remit, I bet you've got the source code cloned n times already. Uh, it's unlikely you actually do need something stronger than that. However, you're going to try to get FedRAMP uh, certification or ISO 27K01, uh, uh, you may actually need to do something else. And so I have seen people run, if they're using GitHub or GitLab Manage, they'll run like Git T or something else or another Git provider and run some sort of script to back that up. Because while it's actually, I think, a really easy thing to do to actually achieve backing it up, the thing that another provider gets you is sort of the insurance. You want to be able to say, hey, while we can do it, we don't want to because you want to be able to have someone pay you or compensate you when it does go wrong. And if you're in charge of your own backup strategy, then you're almost uh, you know, putting more of the eggs in that same basket. And so you really want to be careful there if you do decide to take ownership of it. So I feel like there's a story here, Michael. Like that didn't just come out of nowhere. <laughs> so so I, I wrote I wrote a blog post. So I get asked about it all the time, literally more than any other feature request. And wow. we as a company have never never gone down that road because and I think to your point, Will, like it's a SaaS. And I'm talking about GitHub here, but we all trust Microsoft, don't we? Microsoft own GitHub. We all trust them. Yeah. They, they so, have all my data. I'm counting on them. <laughs> yeah, and if they turn around and charge you on a per repo basis, we're going to get rid of a load of homegrown projects pretty right. damn quick because of that. Um, I, I just, like, I wrote a blog post where basically I'm using 
I'm using Canister. Canister is a an open source project that we maintain um, that is more of an application fra- application specific framework, and you can push this blueprint to go and put, uh, like basically interact with any API. Um, and there's a great open source project out there um, called GitHub. G I C K up. Um, and I use that basically to go and protect it and send it to S3. Um, just, just to say, look, we can do it. Look, if you want to do it, do it this way. Um, are other possible, but even then you go to GitHub and you go to the marketplace or the app store, whatever it's called. I think there's, there's either 57 or 157 backup tools natively in, in their marketplace. So, to your point, Warren, there's definitely a use case, but people just want to offload it to someone else. Like, can you just can you just look after that? But that that was really the only uh, I realized I was talking a lot and needed to needed to switch gears and change it into something else. So I I wanted to get your guys' view on on that as a topic. You can't do that. We're here to grill you, not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now think about what other services or what other SaaS because you'd be you'd be wrong in thinking that GitHub back up your data. It's a shared responsibility model, so the data and the information that you've put in there is your responsibility. They'll keep the service up and running for even free free tier users, but they're not going to back up your data. The data is your responsibility. I mean, I think we have to sort of dive into what what we mean by backups. You know, we we're talking about what is the rely the durability of the of the repositories we give to GitHub. I mean, I be, I think everyone would believe that it, that it's as durable as possible, which is different from if you accidentally delete the data from there, whether or not like if you accidentally go and delete a repository, what's your um, remediation strategy there? So you know, if that's the risk, then for sure you need something else. Uh, if GitHub does go down in some way permanently, you know, zero, 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 one percent or whatever, you know, what's your business continuity strategy? But I, like if if someone came to me today and said, hey, you know, uh, your data could get accidentally deleted from GitHub or GitLab or whatever the provider you're using, and they're not going to do anything like they have no strategy to do that. That data isn't replicated across at least two physical drives somewhere. Uh, you know, I think they're going to lose a lot of customers, uh, you know, just listening to this podcast. A hundred percent, right? And they're going to keep that infrastructure up and running. And the the accidental deletion is kind of hard. Like you've all deleted, a, we've all deleted a repo on there. Like you have to go through some hoops to make that happen. But what about this as a scenario? Like, so hopefully all three of us have MFA on our GitHub account as access. But mm-hmm. it's a SaaS service, right? So anyone could get, if if someone bad or malicious gained access or a malicious internal user had access to a repo and they decided to delete or not even delete. Let's look at the open source issue that happened to, is it X, Y a couple of months ago? Yeah. X, Z, um, the compression library. Uh, for, sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that, that not the same scenario, but you, you let people in, into maintain, they can make changes, blah, blah, blah. Someone makes a change that's malicious to the code or potentially many different malicious activities within that. Do you want to go back to all of your developers' laptops and hope that get get clones have happened, or do you want a point in time restore? I think I think you we're all onto something, um, but I think I think I think I think, I, I think it's an interesting topic. That's where I was. Going yeah, for sure. It. I think it's one of those things that's a long pole, like it's a very long tail. Uh, responsibility like there are tons of companies not even thinking about that and then there but there are things that they should be doing first like they still have passwords as a requirement for authentication for their uis for their users and so like (laughs) please do something about that first before you even start to think about you know source code backup or you know you mentioned mfa like companies that don't you know have passwords but no mfa right it's like 
passwords are like 80, like if you have passwords as any sort of authentication, like 86% chance it will get popped in the next two years. It's, it's like ridiculous. And yet they're, you know, they're thinking about these long tail things. Oh, well, what if one of our developers like exposes their source code or takes it with them? I'm like, that is not the biggest risk you have to worry about. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, the CEO writing his or hers password on the post-it note in their office is the that's the biggest risk but, but they yeah. have to um, so that their assistant has access to the password when they don't make it into oh, the office oh, <laughs> exactly <laughs> and their calendar obviously they need to be able to get into their zoom account right <laughs> absolutely uh, yeah i mean if we're going to go down the risk page right now i think it's the deep fakes uh being sent to your finance or accounting department on behalf of the executive team saying that they should pay out an invoice to a third-party company and they go and do that and so I think, you know, that's that's the biggest risk to a company right now is a direct attacks on their um, their wallet more so than anything else. That was uh, so that made that reminded me of another massive knee jerk change of direction on. Uh, I watched a YouTube video of Ryan Gosling explaining the 101 of LLMs. It wasn't it wasn't. And he's got a ridiculously huge left arm um but uh yeah it, it like it's, he's nailed it he's really good at explaining because someone someone has put that data in there but a huge deep fake um yeah that, that is a biggest a bigger risk so yeah fully <laughs> just to get away from structured open source learning as far as possible source code repository backup and and uh, deep fake Ryan Gosling's. Well, I mean, I think it's super relevant, right? You have s such a good source of knowledge here that would be a shame to lose in some way. And I think, you know, even GitHub has this idea of the Arctic code backup program where they're locking it in some vault. Hypothetically, I don't know what that actually amounts to. So I can imagine, you know, I didn't, I didn't check, but maybe you've got an award here associated with this that, that says it's being saved somewhere important. I don't know what they did with their awards. Yeah, I've got a, a badge for um, contributing to the Arctic Vault program, although I have no idea what that program is or what I did to contribute to it. Oh, it should actually, it should actually tell you. Like mine was like contributing to some AWS source code and some things that were used on like one of the NASA rovers. I just saw a bunch of colorful badges there one day and hovered out over them and then moved on with my life. <laughs> you know, like in the... I, I try not to get involved in side quests. How do you know what the main quest is? So funny story, um, because at the end of every day, um, the last thing I do at night is I write down the five things that I want to be focused on for the next day. Oh, wow. And anything that's not one of those five, I just ignore. Um, a, a barring, you know, like... Um, Hey, we've got a production outage. You know, I can't really go. Nope, oh, sorry, didn't schedule that. I'll see if I can get it on tap for tomorrow. <laughs> but I, I use that. I've used that method for years, and it's been the only way for me to stay focused and on track. I think that's a really great idea, actually. I've tried the every electronic version of it I can find. Um, I've even tried like just doing it in notebooks, but. For me personally, the only thing that works is the three by five card. And then it's just either on my desk or when I leave my desk, I put it in my pocket. So no matter where I'm at, I know what I'm supposed to be focused on. That's the legacy units for anyone who doesn't know. He's saying inches, uh, which not centimeters. <laughs> no, it's three centimeters by five centimeters. <laughs> That's, uh, pretty small there. Yeah, it, it keeps me from taking on too much each day <laughs> by limiting the writing space. My day has gotten so much better. <laughs> I think there's something that goes, you know, when you're actually physically writing it out, I, I do find that has an imprint in you more than, say, typing it into it. So, like, when I'm in my meetings, I tend to have a notebook and I write things down. Uh, actually, it's not, like, saved. I usually write on a piece of scrap paper and then throw it away after the meeting. And <laughs> it, it just it does wonders for me, realistically, uh, to remember what, I, what I've gone or what I've discussed. It really has nothing to do with the medium which I've chosen. Yeah, agreed. Physical, physically writing something is increases my retention and comprehension immensely. What about you, Michael? You digital or analog? So a bit of both. You can 
probably see there's there's paper all here. Um, yeah, so a bit of both, but because I'm constantly, it seems, or at least recently on, on an aeroplane, it's, there's a lot of notes and a lot of draft emails, actually, that I seem to use. I, I use email for that than I do actually communicate it. Definitely got the emails in my outbox for sure. Uh, when I'm traveling, there's, there's no alternative, yeah. unfortunately. Excellent. Well, should we move on and do some picks? All right, let's do it. What'd you bring Warren? Yeah. Uh, so I'm on my book, uh, rants. So this week is going to be management 3.0 by Jurgen Apello. I found that very early on in my career, it was a great way to think about uh, as an aspiring leader to how to build the work around a team and even move to an agile perspective. Uh, there are still companies out there that aren't doing agile. And while there, it's not totally married to that aspect, it really does help you think through uh, what to do in certain situations, how to prioritize work effectively at a team level. Uh, and I just, I can't recommend it enough for those that are thinking about not just the code that they should write or what they should work on that day, but how to collaborate effectively, how to track that work and uh, prioritize requests that are coming in from either other teams or from the business. Speaking of collaborating effectively, hearing is such a key part of that. And um, I have terrible hearing, like between just like the the background roar and tinnitus with the the really loud ringing it's really hard for me to hear. And I've had my hearing tested multiple times and they say, Oh, there's nothing that hearing aids can do for that. Best of luck to you. I'm like, okay, thanks. But I did get recently a pair of AirPod pro AirPods pro two, and they've got like a background noise reduction feature feature on them. And that's actually been super cool. So that's my pick for the week because it does a great job of like filtering out that, roaring background noise especially when you're in a big open environment so that you can hear the conversation going on around you um, the downside to it is that everyone sees you have airpods in so they assume that you're listening to the adventures in devops podcast and not really interested in talking one-on-one -on -one. so that's the trade-off there but um that's going to be my pick of the week michael what about you uh, i guess mine goes i know we spoke about the five k's a day and yeah. I think like my my background is is rugby, uh, knocking knocking seven bells of uh, stuff out of people on a Saturday after a busy week of weird and wonderful things. Obviously, that's gone away. You're getting older. I can't really do that anymore. Um, but that five k a day, just as Warren kind of put it as well, is it just takes you out of that that busy busy mode. And I massively encourage it to any everyone should be moving anyway for health and fitness but that brain rest as well like i i get some of the best ideas when i'm at least two and a half k away from my house like so just that mindfulness of of escaping from something that you're potentially stuck on trying to fix takes you away from it like that that, that seems to be working for me at the moment. I'm up to 150 odd days of uh, continuous continuous walking or continuous nice. 5K in the spirit of DevOps. Nice. Uh, you know, that's why I asked you about listening to podcast or music because I've had a similar experience when I'm out on runs. Um, it's number one, meditative, but number two, just so helpful for sorting the the mental clutter and and reflection and i've gotten to the point now where i don't take any i don't listen to anything no music no podcast nothing just out there just me and my thoughts and that's been pretty wild yeah, <laughs> don't I laugh Warren. <laughs> <laughs> what's the homer simpson quote all right brain I don't like you and you don't like me, but it's just the two of us. So we got to get through this <laughs> or let's get through this so I can get back to killing you with beer. <laughs> yeah. So that's, um, I, I, I hear you on that. Like getting out and moving is just great, not only physically, but it's so helpful mentally as well. And I would, I would highly recommend at least giving it a shot without anything, you know, 
just you and your thoughts because it's going to be it's going to be wild but um so there we go michael thank you so much i really enjoyed having you on the show yeah thanks for having me guys would love to have you back at any point just uh hit us up and let us know and for sure when we're ready for the I got to figure out where the, what year this, this is 2024. So when we're ready for the 2025 edition of 90 days of DevOps, I look forward to having you back. Awesome. We'll figure out what it needs to be. I'm sure there'll be some LLMs and uh, AI associated to it as the trend keeps going. Right. Just ask chat GPT to create it for you. Yeah, there you go. Because there, there won't be any hallucinations in that. <laughs> right. Awesome. Warren, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, of course. And for all of our listeners, thank you for listening, and we will see y'all next week.